Hi guys, it's Mrs. Schacht here, and I'm here to discuss some social reform movements that took place in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And so we're going to focus on which groups fought specifically for equality during this time, how were they inspired by both the civil rights and the women's rights movements, and then how do these social movements pave the way for the rise of conservatism in the United States? So the first movement I'd like to talk about centers on Hispanic Americans. As we know, before World War II, uh, many Hispanic Americans lived in the southwestern portion of the United States, and many returned um, to work during and after World War II, and many actually moved into parts of the Midwest and the East Coast. But there were many Hispanic Americans that still worked as migrant farm workers, and many returned to these jobs even after World War II. And so what you guys are going to see is the rise of something called the Chicano movement. And this is going to be led by Cesar Chavez, as well as a woman by the name of Dolores Huerta. And together, they're going to form the community service organization to promote, promote civil rights, specifically for Mexican Americans. Additionally, Cesar Chavez is going to focus on the rights of migrant farm workers, and he's going to create the United Farm Workers Organization, which is a union for these agricultural workers. And in 1965, there's going to be a huge boycott of grapes across the United States um, to try and draw attention to the way that migrant farm workers were treated, specifically out in places like California. Um, in 1968, Cesar Chavez also draws attention to the cause by performing a hunger strike, um, very similar to the tactics of Gandhi. And he embraces this hunger strike for 28 days. And as you can see in the photo, is visited by Robert Kennedy during this time. Um, arguably, the work of Chavez and Dolores Huerta was really important and resulted in the California grape growers um, signing contracts with the United Farm Workers Organization and recognizing the union so that they could bargain for better pay and better working conditions. So again, um, a lot of these groups you're gonna hear about today are all kind of inspired by both the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement. And I think you're gonna see a lot of the same themes running throughout. Okay, we also saw the rise of AIM, also known as the American Indian Movement during this time period. They were very much inspired by both the Chicano movement and the Black Power movement. Um, there were approximately 800,000 Native Americans in the United States. However, the unemployment rate of Native Americans was approximately 10 times the national average. And so in order to draw attention to the conditions that existed among Native American communities, more specifically unemployment, lack of education, basic resources, etc., there were a series of protests throughout the United States in 1969, and probably the one that drew the most attention is what you see here. And this is where um, AIM took over um, Alcatraz, which is the prison just off the coast of San Francisco, and occupied Alcatraz for 19 months. Um, arguably, it took some time, but in 1975, let me fix my slide here. I don't know if you guys can see that at the bottom. In 1975, the Indian Self-Determination Act was passed, which gave tribes and or reservations control over things like education and law enforcement as well as provided compensation for uh, violations of past treaties. Okay, I know that Mr. Irvin also touched on um, gay rights in his video last week, but I also just wanted to bring it up here and specifically discuss the Stonewall riots in 1969. So many states had laws on the books that made it a crime um, to be gay. And there were a couple of bars, specifically in the Greenwich Village area of New York City, um, 
that were raided by the police and the, they would come in and kind of harass the patrons and threaten them. And this was something that, you know, became common um, right around the time of Stonewall. So the Stonewall riots are named after the Stonewall Inn, um, which is a very famous, like I said, gay bar in the Greenwich Village neighborhood in New York City. And in June of 1969, um, the police came in and raided the bar. And this led to a massive, um, almost week-long protest among the gay community in New York City. And so for the next six days, there were protests, um, the bar was burned, and there were lots of confrontations with the police. However, um, the Stonewall riots start to pave the way for the creation of gay rights activists and groups. So the Gay Activists Alliance was created. Um, the concept of gay pride celebrations became common in major cities across the United States. And ultimately it drew attention specifically to um, gay rights here in the US. So I know that, like I said, Mr. Irvin mentioned that when he, in his video last week, but I still wanted to bring it up as again, yet another example of groups that feel inspired by the change that happened with the civil rights movement and with the women's rights movements and continue to fight for equality just as those groups had done in the past. And then of course, um, I'm gonna end it with talking about the environmental movement. So we know in the past that there was an environmental movement um, during Teddy Roosevelt's presidency where he focused specifically on protecting land, um, whether that was through creating national parks or protecting resources. Teddy Roosevelt's um, square deal programs in the early 1900s is considered to be kind of the first environmental movement. But there is a second one that takes place in the 60s and 70s. And again, I think it's really due to all of um, the change that's happening and people you know, are inspired by that change. Um, Rachel Carson writes a book in 1962 called Silent Spring. Um, she is a marine biologist and she actually wrote a book um, about DDT, which was a very lethal toxic pesticide that was used. And people, you know, read this book and they were horrified that DDT was being, you know, sprayed on crops and then these crops were eventually consumed by humans. And so, you know, in her book, she said how the DDT gets inside the food chain and then once it's in the food chain and it's consumed, it can lead to things like um, cancer or genetic damage. So this book really kind of kickstarts a second environmental movement. And there are several laws that are passed during the 1970s as a result. So one of the biggest things that happens is the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency is created in 1970. And this is kind of the umbrella or the government organization that oversees things like pollution, um, emissions that businesses um, and factories uh, release into the atmosphere. And what you're gonna start to see is a series of laws that are gonna be passed kind of underneath the purview of the EPA. Of course, we have both the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, which um, allows the federal government to impose limitations on the emissions that factories and businesses are either releasing into the atmosphere or releasing into our water sources. Um, and then we have the Endangered Species Act, which um, essentially creates a list of species that are endangered and seeks to protect the habitats or restore the habitats of those animals. Um, and so whereas maybe Teddy Roosevelt's environmental movement focused on more so the protection of land, what this environmental movement is doing in the 60s and 70s is now giving more power to the federal government to regulate what businesses and factories are emitting into the atmosphere. Um, even though it's a fantastic start, it doesn't mean that it's perfect. 
Um, and unfortunately, there is a nuclear meltdown, which is known as the Three Mile Island accident in Pennsylvania in 1979. It is the largest nuclear accident in the United States. And by both mechanical and human error, there was a nuclear meltdown, which unfortunately released radioactive material into the atmosphere. Over 100,000 people uh, fled their homes in order to maintain the safety and not to be exposed to um, the nuclear uh, radioactive material. As a result, um, no new nuclear plants were built in the United States afterwards. But at the same time, 20% of our power still does come from nuclear reactors. So guys, I hope that helps you understand a little bit more about reform movements in the United States and some of the groups that fought for change. Um, there is going to be a response to all of this change. And this is going to come in the form of a shift in conservative um, candidates for the presidency and conservative politicians. Um, when they look at the economic issues of the 1970s, the war in Vietnam, women's rights, and then of course, combined with all of these social reform groups, many Americans are gonna start to shift their support toward conservative candidates, such as uh, future Republican President Ronald Reagan, who can restore America to kind of these, um, I guess, more traditional ways and values. And so a lot of these reform movements will lead to a political shift. Um, hope that helps you guys understand uh, social reform movements and hope you guys have a great day.